welcome everyone to the forum. Uh, Welcome to everyone who is watching us uh, online on our various platforms. Great to have all of you who are here today and folks are still coming in. Uh, my name is Mike Kinman. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm super excited about, uh, about today uh, because today we are going to see the first report. And really, this is uh, you'll see what sort of the next steps are from this. But about two years ago, uh, we began two groups that we called Telling the Whole Story groups. Uh, and uh, this came, the, the phrase telling the whole story came from a sermon that I had seen that uh, the Bishop Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs preached, where she said over and over again, uh, you have to tell the whole story so we can write a new story. And really what it is, is we have to delve into our history and as much as possible, tell the whole story about our history. Now, you're never going to be able to tell the whole story because every story is infinite in a breadth and depth, but we need to tell as much of a story as we can uh, and own it uh, so we can make decisions about the future. And what we started to talk about is how this is really part of what we look at as uh, followers of Jesus and also as Episcopalians as our sacrament of reconciliation. Uh, the sacrament of reconciliation is something that has five parts. The first part is called self-examination. And what that means is to really hold the mirror up to ourselves and to say, let's look at what we have done and left undone, said and left unsaid, all those different things. And part of that holding the mirror up to ourselves is also listening. It's listening to the people who have been impacted by our actions, our words, or by lack of same. Uh, and, and getting, really, the whole story of the past. Uh, and, and it really is, it's a dynamic, in some ways organic process, because it needs to be in conversation with people whom we may have wounded by our action uh, or our inaction. Uh, and those who may have been wounded by us will get to tell us if we're getting it right. Uh, the second step of that is called confession, which is kind of what we're used to. We do that in church on Sunday. And it's saying this specifically are the things, these specifically are the things that we have done to break relationship, because that's what sin is. Sin is broken relationship with God, with each other, with the creation, with ourselves. These are the things that we have done. And again, it's a dynamic conversational process where those we have wounded get to say, yeah, you got that right, or no, you didn't. Um, then we look at reparation or repair. And again, it's that process. We say, what does it take to uh, repair the damage that we have done. And, and again, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a process where others, you know, we get to go to those we've wounded and say, well, what will it take to repair that damage? And we agree on that and we take reparative steps. So when you hear people talk about reparations, uh, reparation is both a political and it's also a theological term. Um, then we talk about amendment of life, because if we go back and do the same stuff over again, well, we haven't learned anything, we haven't changed anything, and we're likely to wound again. And so then we, we work together and we say, okay, how can we make changes moving forward together to make sure that we won't wound each other again in this way? Uh, and then, then comes absolution, which is declaring, okay, now we are in right relationship. But of course, the nature of human relationship is we mess up all the time. Um, so it's saying, okay, you know, in the, but in the future when we mess up, we've got a process for this. As we say now, we've got an app for that. Uh, and that app is the, the, this, this process of reconciliation. So we took two uh, really discrete things. Uh, the first, you know, one was the stained glass windows in our church. And we say, how do we tell the whole story of those stained glass windows, the history of them, and also the impact that they have had on people? And then, you know, so the telling the whole story group really is just that first step. How do we tell as much of the story as we can? And then in relationship, we really say, okay, so where is the sin? Where have we broken relationship? And then we can talk about what does reparation look like? What does amendment of life look like? The second of those groups is the one that's going to be making its presentation today. And it's looking uh, 
at the land that All Saints Church currently occupies, and that is both this at 132 Euclid and the house where I live at 540 uh, Woodland Road, also in Pasadena. Uh, and as you're going to see and hear, this has been an exhaustive process, um, and it has been done uh, in conversation with those who used to occupy this land uh, and through extensive research. And so there's a whole bunch to present. I don't want to take up any more time uh, telling you, sort of framing the process. Instead, um, I want to turn it over to Hannah Earnshaw, and, and I, I just want to say Hannah has spent two years uh, really running point on this particular process in this group, has done, you know, they've done just incredible work, uh, you know, also serving on the vestry and in choir and doing other things. So this isn't the only thing uh, that they've been working on. Uh, but I, I really, you're going to see uh, over the next 45 minutes the amount of work that went into this. And so I, I just want to start by saying, Hannah, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you have done. And you, th this is such a gift to our congregation. And I'm just going to hand the mic to you. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, so uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hannah. My pronouns are they, them. And um, over the past couple of years, I've had the um, honor of co-convening this uh, Tame the Whole Story group about the land. I'm joined with two of my uh, teammates in that group, uh, Becky Nicolaitis and Barbara Dubrensky. And um, today, yeah, we are going to uh, tell that story, or as much of it as we can, in 45 minutes. Um, when we started out on this journey, one of the first things we did is talk about the scope of what we wanted to cover in this story. And so, as Mike mentioned, we, we wanted to talk about this land here at, at Euclid Avenue that we are on. We also wanted to talk about the rectory, which is also land that All Saints owns. And we also wanted to talk about the other plots of land that All Saints has owned in the past, such as its um, Garfield location, which you'll learn about in a bit, um, the other rectory locations that it's used. Then also we wanted to think about where do we need to begin in order to tell the stories? How far back do we need to go? And uh, we really felt it was important to go back to the original people who lived on this land, the indigenous Tonga people, and then to work forward from there through the various different waves of colonization that happened, the Spanish, the Mexican, and the American, um, coming up to the formation of Pasadena and then... Um, all Saints Church as a part of, of that story. And so um, uh, the, the exact plots of land that All Saints use, um, they, it's a little less meaningful as you go back in time. And so kind of we start out uh, quite with a quite wide geographic area and scope and then sort of narrow in on All Saints land as we get towards the time that All Saints was active. So um, before we jump into that story, I'm going to briefly hand over to Becky, who's going to talk a bit about how we actually went about putting that story together. Great, okay. Um, I just also want to give a shout out to Hannah for the amazing work. Hannah is a Caltech astronomer by day and became a historian um, in, the, in the process of doing this and really did some amazing archival research and digging and I really appreciated all of their leadership and work on this. So I just wanted to share a few words about our approach and methods that we used in putting this report together and bringing all of this, this history and material together. Um, and there's a lot more details about this in the full narrative history that we wrote, which will become available at, um, uh, soon, I think. And so I just, I'll break this up quickly, um, chronologically in terms of the sources and methods. So for the pre-colonization era, we focused especially on two aspects of the Tongva people, their use and relation to the land and their spiritual beliefs, um, as we felt that was sort of most relevant to what we were trying to do um, with this whole uh, this whole um, initiative. So we conducted this research and other research about the Tongva in collaboration with local Tongva groups and especially Edgar Perez, who pointed us in the direction of some really useful source material um, that, that we used. Um, for the colonization period, which covered the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, the, period of Spanish, Mexican, and then American control of the land. We relied on 
a few key books, uh, one especially important one being um, by uh, Yvette Saavedra, Before the Roses, which focused especially on Pasadena. That was a really um, critical source for us. And then for the All Saints period, which roughly is from the 1880s on to today, um, we drew on a variety of records, including archival records that were in some file cabinets in a room somewhere near here. Um, and Hannah led that effort as well, um, really digging into that material. We also leaned on histories of all saints that had been written um, over the you know last number of years. One was um, Reverend Leslie Learned's History of All Saints Church from 1942, and the other was Jack Levan's All Saints, a pictorial, a pictorial history from 2008. Um, and then our research, we, we wanted to try to figure out where the rect, like what rectories um, that All Saints owned over the years and where they were and how they, you know, how the church came to acquire those properties. And um, we did some digging on Ancestry.com um, using like census records and city directories. And, um, that, and then we juxtaposed that information against the old federal redlining maps to kind of see how that meshed with uh, practices of segregation in Pasadena. And we also held interview sessions with Tongva members and um, I actually conducted an in-depth oral history with Edgar Perez, which I believe we're also going to make available to um, the parish. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. So the first thing to remember that when we begin the story is that this land has always been sacred. So this is a map of Tovanga, uh, the world in the language of the Tonga people uh, who are indigenous to this region and uh, covers what is now known today as the Los Angeles Basin. Um, and if we go back 500 years, 1,000 years, thousands of years, uh, these were the primary people who lived in this area. And uh, at the time, the Los Angeles Basin looked a lot different than it does today. Um, it's a watershed. It was full of wetlands, uh, forests, a lot of native trees, oaks, walnuts, willows. It was full of abundant animal life and abundant human life. Um, throughout the area, uh, there were about probably 50 to 100 Tonka villages. Um, each would have contained sort of on order 100 people. Um, and there wasn't really so much a unified tribal sort of identity or government. Uh, these were very much kind of self-governing villages grouped by family lineage. Um, and they would uh, trade with one another. They would meet up for uh, religious ceremonies. They would intermarry um, and uh, trade not all, only with each other, but also with neighboring tribes with which they had good relationships. And um, to some extent, a small amount with um, Europeans when the first contact was made in the 1500s. Um, and if we zoom in, um, so actually, actually, I'll go back, just briefly mention that uh, this was um, some uh, research uh, published, um, well, uh, reported on by the LA Times a few years ago. It just shows where a lot of those villages were likely located. And if we zoom in on the Pasadena area there, we have a helpful you are here, Arrow, please take it with a pinch of salt if you are watching online. Um, but we know that um, in the Pasadena area, there were several uh, nearby Tonga villages. There are a couple that, um, whose location is well known, one example being Ahamongna, which is up uh, basically about where JPL is today. Um, and several other villages, some of which we're not entirely sure anymore exactly where they were, but we know that they were in the area. Um, and so while we don't think that there was a Tonga village like, exactly on this church location, uh, this land this, and the land of Pasadena itself would have been used by the people um, for various things. It was probably mostly grassland interspersed with groves of trees. So it would have been used for hunting animals, for food and resources, for gathering acorns, which were a staple part of the Tonga diet, um, and simply from traveling from place to place. And the use of the land by the Tongva people was not only kind of practical and economical, but it was also spiritual. To them, the land is sacred. Um, 
and uh, according to one uh, creation tradition of the Tongva people, um, it's the land and the sky coming together that, um, and in that joining created uh, all plant life and animal life and human life, which was a part of um, this wider creation and a wider spiritual reality uh, with which, for which humans weren't the center of the universe, but just kind of a strand in a wider web of life. And so for the Tongva, um, the use of the land and the caretaking of the land um, uh, was kind of governed by religious rules. And that's not to say that they were kind of arbitrary rules, but um, that care of the land was seen as kind of a, a spiritual duty um, to the people. And, um, and these rules would have contained things like um, there were rules for the sharing of resources to prevent the hoarding of food, and um, there were um, rules around how the land was managed. So, for example, the practice of controlled burning, uh, which would uh, clear away old brush and allow room for new growth, release seeds, um, which would then be harvested. And so kind of a thing that I think is important to take away from this is that while the Tongva were hunter-gatherer people, that's not to say they lived in some kind of untamed wilderness, which they then kind of harvested from um, passively, but that this was an actively managed homeland. It was abundant because it was managed and looked after um, in a way that was sustainable for centuries, millennia, and may have been so far into the future were it not for the onset of colonization. And for that, I'm going to hand over to Barbara. So I'm just going to do a five-minute primer on colonization. Some of it may be familiar to you from your education, but I thought it'd be a good reminder. And where I'm going to start is at the continental level and then move towards California and then review what the specific experience was for the Tongva people. Um, so global uh, European colonization was occurring on this continent between the 16th and 18th centuries. The primary uh, countries that were involved in that colonization were Great Britain, Netherlands, France, and Spain. And their overall goal in, in colonizing in this area was to expand land ownership so they could spread their population out, um, enhance wealth through taking the natural resources of this land and exporting it back to their homeland, and to spread and strengthen the religious religion and religious practices that they carried. Um, so as you move to the western coast of both North and South America, you start to see um, specifically extraction of gold and silver. Those are some of the most uh, critical raw materials that they were uh, going after, expanding the land and therefore the lives that were um, connected to that home country, were loyal to that home country, and then uh, indoctrination of their religion, particularly the Catholic religion. Um, and they were competing with one another so that they could sort of out-colonize one another, you know, very competitive to get to that land and those resources. And then they were also thinking of ways that they could establish bases where they could pull together their resources and launch expeditions to explore and find more to colonize. Um, in this time, you see the colonization and the, the conquests of the Aztecs and Incans. Um, you're seeing them consider the indigenous population as someone that they can create um, as or turn towards being Spanish subjects. Um, and then when you move specifically, so that's along the western coast of, of both continents, and then you start to look, when you start to look at California, you see um, there were 100,000 acres that were kind of developed or uh, set aside specifically to set up the mission, something where most of us are familiar with. Um, and the purpose of those, com those uh, missions were to cultivate the culture and religion of those uh, colonizing the Spanish. Um, and the term that was used in bringing, attempting to bring these people into the culture was to turn indigenous folk into people of reason. Um, they used the, some of the practices that we're familiar with, baptism, Christianizing of names, um, and also some of the uh, physical punishment that was already embedded in those religions um, used as spiritual rehabilitation, um, and just generally cultivating fear as a way to get compliance. Um, they expected the uh, Tongva, the indigenous people, uh, to 
become Spanish speaking. And they also saw them as an opportunity for agricultural labor. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, how the land was used differently at that time. And they, of course, expected at some point that there would be uh, an ability to build a tax base from this group of individuals. So in addition to just um, the sort of conversion aspect, the interaction with the Spanish really weakened the health and well-being of the indigenous people in California. So as we've heard a lot about, about um, the diseases that were brought uh, from Spain that affected the individuals here, there was not an investment in making sure that if you were going to bring these populations together in the way they did, that there would be sanitary conditions. And, and bringing them together in these missions was not conducive with how they were living beforehand. Um, they experienced rape and sexual abuse. Uh, and as, as Hannah spoke to so eloquently, there was a disruption of their relationship with the ecosystem and food systems. Um, and then there was an expectation that the indigenous folk would be using the, the clothing, the utensils, and other types of goods um, from those home countries. And then part of the uh, plan for the colonization was to protect those missions with garrisons and later to um, develop pueblos um, in, in the future. Um, so as we, many of us know, the Mexican-American War then occurred between 1810 and 1821. And so there was, once that uh, was over, there was this shift by the Mexican government to what was really like a, a very informal uh, private land system. And their focus was more on getting more economic development out of that land, so growing the wealth. And so they prioritized distributing the land to individuals who they felt had the capital to develop the land and, and grow the wealth as they expected. Um, they were less focused on religion, a little bit more focused on their secular culture, but it was still an indoctrination, indoctrination to that culture. Um, and in terms of the indigenous folk having an opportunity to be a part of that land system, their opportunities were, were not viable. Um, they were expected to not live according to the cult their culture in order to do that. Um, as, as Hannah spoke to, their views on land and land ownership were different, and it was essentially just a very onerous process. Um, and, the, and again, there was that, expect, there was that um, thought by colonizers of uh, we could use this uh, population as uh, a labor pool. So the laws that they set were with that aim in mind. And then finally, um, as you throughout the 1830s and 40s, while the land is owned by um, the Mexican government, you're starting to see illegal immigration from the eastern part of this continent into this area. And those immigrants were not interested in the local culture, the, neither the indigenous nor the Mexican culture had a real sense of um, Euro-American culture being superior, so there was not an interest in assimilating. Um, and as you uh, move into the uh, Mexican-American War, you see a change in how we're gonna look at owning the land. So there were a number of policies that went into place after that war. Um, the preceding preemption act of 1841, which basically allowed for squatters' rights and then sold the land to those individuals from the east for a very uh, low amount. Um, the Federal Land Act, which required um, Mexican landowners to prove their ownership, which, because remember that was a loose process, that was hard to do. And then finally, the California Land Act of 1851 as well, which created a commission to look at those claims, most of which were rejected. So again, these processes were very onerous, and there were policies put in place, even just sort of um, civil policies, that cultivated an opportunity to direct the indigenous folk into being a labor pool. Um, and then, so going, going back in time again to um, the, the Spanish colonization forward and look at specifically the Tongva experience. So you have the Portola expedition, which uh, founded the San Gabriel mission. So, you know, one month the, the, um, is the landing in LA and then by September, um, they're creating the San Gabriel Mission. Um, and so there was um, 1.5 million acres that were invested in this. It includes Rancho San Pascual, which we'll talk about its relationship to Pasadena specifically. Um, and through this process, the petitions by Native people to gain land are basically just, um, they're set up to fail. Um, multiple indigenous societies are also being, um, as, as, as Hannah mentioned, 
brought together and treated as though they are one. Um, if they did resist, there was violence or exile. Um, and the, that practical and spiritual relationship that the Tongva people had to the land is replaced by farming. And then finally, um, the, those villages that we saw on the map are unacknowledged by the American land system after the Mexican-American War, and uh, residents are essentially evicted and exploited as labor continually. I will pass it over to Becky. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give, uh, let me grab the, the clicker. So is it, um, let's see. Oops, make sure I'm, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna give a brief history of the All Saints period, um, starting around the 1880s, and the kind of the major land transactions um, by the church that essentially brought us to where we are today in terms of control of this land, control and ownership of this land. So by the 1870s, um, as Barbara brought us up to that point, um, the American landowners it, who now had control of, you know, pretty much this entire area, they started selling off parcels in the areas that would become Pasadena. So this map um, that you're seeing, which is from 1874, shows the original Lake Vineyard subdivision that encompasses what would become central Pasadena. So here's another view from right around that time of Pasadena showing just how rural the land was in the 1870s. This is from 1876, looking north on Orange Grove. So just six years after this photo um, up on the screen, in 1882, All Saints was first formed. And it started in a humble way. Um, it began holding services in temporary spaces, all very close to where we're sitting right now, um, very in close proximity to where, to where we are now. The first service was held in the home of this man um, named C.C. Brown. His house was at the northwest corner of Lake and Walnut, where the old Conrad's <laughs> restaurant was, if some of you remember that. And he hosted the first 11 members of All Saints in those earliest services at his house. And then next, they moved to a public school building, and then they did it in a grocery store on the second floor of that store, again, kind of all nearby. And at this point, it was called the All Saints Mission being a mission church of the Church of Our Savior in San Gabriel um, at that very early point. So in 1884, that is when All Saints purchases its first um, parcel of land uh, known as the Garfield site. So this was um, a lot at the corner of Colorado and Garfield across the street from where the post office was and is. So parishioners built a small wood frame church there and they held the first services there on Easter Sunday in 1885. And then the following year in 1886 is when um, the, the parish decides to uh, incorporate, uh, or the parishioners decided to incorporate as a parish. And just as a, as a little side note, a few years after that, this property was sold by All Saints and the land was sold and the building itself uh, was also sold and it was moved to the corner of Raymond and Claremont and it's now the Community Church of Pasadena, little fun fact. Um, but just, so going back to uh, 1886, they're at that site. The following year in 1887, All Saints purchases two adjacent lots um, on Euclid Avenue, which is the land where we are right now. Um, I wanna make sure I'm on this, the right slide there. And over the years on this Euclid site, there were various structures that were built on the property, starting with this church behind me and various adjacent buildings, including a parish house. And nearly 40 years later, after um, 
that initial purchase, this old church was torn down. And then by 1924, construction was started on, um, or sorry, was completed on the Granite Gothic Revival Church that still stands today, and which is our church today. And over the years, All Saints acquired more land to expand the campus. One entity that kept coming up in our research was this Maryland hotel that we kept we kept coming across this Maryland hotel. So the church's immediate neighbor um, early on was the Maryland hotel, which owned a lot of the, the large block. If you can visualize the block along Los, Los Robles between Colorado and, and Walnut. So the Maryland hotel owned much of that property. So we found this photo. Um, showing the Maryland Hotel in 1907. And the map to the right is an old Sanborn fire insurance map, which kind of gives you a really detailed look at um, property in, in the area. And you can kind of see that the Maryland Hotel owned much of that entire rectangular block there. And you can see where All Saints is within um, that, that block. So over the years, All Saints purchased chunks of land from the Maryland Hotel to incrementally expand its campus. In 1940, it bought um, some, some property to the south of the church. And then in the biggest purchase was in 1961, when the church bought what was called the Maryland Hotel parcel, which included the entire expanse of land north of the church all the way to Walnut, excluding Hutch's Barbecue. Um, and that land was purchased for a half a million dollars in 1961. And at the time that it was purchased, interestingly, um, what was on the, ho the land at that time in, in 1961 uh, was nine offices, 32 apartment units, two doctor's offices, and three stores. So among All Saints uh, leaders at the time, there were some discussions about, um, built, about what to do with that property. Some thought maybe they should build a home for the aged on the property, but ultimately church leaders decided to tear down all of those structures and build a parking lot. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's very Los Angeles. Um, okay, and then in addition to the Euclid campus, um, we also were digging into trying to find some history on the rectories that the church owned over the years. And our research uncovered three rectories, which are the homes that the rectors would live in over the years, and also two homes purchased for other clergy members over the years. And there may have been other properties that we just didn't find in this round of research, um, just as a FYI. What was significant to us about these properties is they were all located in neighborhoods that were racially segregated and, you know, quote unquote, protected neighborhoods in the parlance of, of that period, those earlier years, using tools like race restrictive covenants. So this showed up in um, federal redlining appraisal maps from the, the late 1930s. Um, indicating that these areas were, you know, quote, protected from racial hazards. What, you know, this was a reality for a lot of areas of Pasadena at the time, and I think it's certainly part of the legacy of the property ownership by the church, which would have excluded African Americans and other people of color, presumably also including indigenous people, um, basically from, from living in those neighborhoods. So that's a kind of nutshell history of the land immediately um, belonging to the church. And I'll turn it back to Hannah. Thank you. Yeah, so kind of we've reached um, up through uh, the previous century and up to the present day, but what we wanted to do was then circle back to the Tongva people um, there not an extinct tribe as much as uh, rumor tried to make people think so um, in the last century. Um, they're still around today and affected by um, this history that we've kind of uh, given you a brief overview of today. And so to kind of hear a bit more about um, 
how this has affected um, the Tonga people up to the present day. Who better to hear from than the Tonga themselves? So we have a short video uh, from um, Edgar Perez, who we've mentioned as um, one of our primary contacts in, um, in the Tonga. I wonder, could you press play on the laptop? I don't think I can do it from here. Keith, any ideas you have would be wonderful. While we wait a moment, I also want to um, say that kind of the work to um, kind of start healing the um, kind of the broken uh, relationship with the land um, uh, between the Tonga people and the land is still yeah. ongoing today. Um, and one of the groups that is doing work in that area is called the Tongva um, Tara. Uh, let me say this right: Tongva Tara Hapahava Conservancy. Um, which uh, facilitated the uh, rematriation, the return of the land to its indigenous caretakers of, so far, one acre of land up in Altadena, which is now back in the possession of the Tongva people and under their care. Um, and um, also put the organizational uh, machinery in place in order to kind of enable that in the future. This particular acre was um, kind of bequested to the Tongva people in a will. And so, um, that, that is now something that people in this area can uh, do through that organization. If you want to find out more about them, you can go to tongva.land. Um, I think we're still figuring yeah. out the machinery of the laptop. <laughs> okay. yeah, we'll, we can we post this on the Okay. We will post this online. Please we'll look out for it. <laughs> yeah. It's like one of the most important parts of our presentation. So, yeah. So, yeah All right. Ahead. Yes. Keep an eye out for that later then. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to uh, finish off by um, saying that basically this was a very kind of uh, top level speed run of um, the history of this land. Um, you can find the full story in a report that we're going to release soon. It's over 30 pages, and it is, as of this weekend, completely finished. Um, so what we're going to do um, is we're going to send it around to a few different um, people, including some of our con Tongva contacts, to just kind of review our work, kind of uh, check it that we haven't missed anything obvious. Um, and once we've kind of incorporated any feedback that they might have, um, uh, we will uh, then publish that on the website, on the church website, with along with a lot of our research materials and um, kind of some summaries of uh, what we found. Um, we uh, will also basically, so remember this was the first step of this kind of five-step reconciliation um, that Mike told us about in the beginning. And so um, we can consider this work to be the first step um, and hopefully kind of lead into the second confession um, but what really now has to happen next is that the vestry is going to pick this up and um, uh, establish a committee or some other way of um, basically looking at, okay, what actions do we now need to take in order to um, do the uh, repair and um, reparations that is, is needed um, so that we can now move on through that process um, going forward. Um, and which will include consulting with the Tongva people, with those who were initially hurt. And so what I want to um, leave us with is uh, basically, hopefully, a guide um, towards step two. It's like four main points, which I think we should take away from the story um, that All Saints needs to think about and grapple with 
um, as we move forward in this process. So one of them being the uh, genocide of the indigenous peoples of this area, uh, one of them being the environmental destruction that took place here, um, one of them being the um, buying and selling of property in racially exclusive neighborhoods, and um, also the removal of housing from uh, the Euclid plot that was never replaced by the church. So these are all um, yeah, things to uh, bear in mind going forward. And uh, with that, I guess we'll open it for any questions we have right. time for. Yeah, I, I wanted to, first of all, can we just thank this group for this amazing work? Um, and, and have a few minutes for questions. And, and I also, uh, and I want to, I'm sort of looking at the three of you as I say what I'm saying, so you can either say, yes, you're right, no, you're wrong, or somewhere in between. Um, my sense in um, my own conversations with the Tongva and with other in members of indigenous nations is um, the concept of property rights as we understand them now is largely a Western European construct. Um, and uh, so, you know, even that, that idea of ownership of land. Uh, and, and so, you know, part of the challenge that, that we have uh, is even a conversation of, well, we should give the back land back to whoever owned it. Well, they never considered themselves owning the land. The land was an extension of the people. The land was, again, it was a spiritual entity uh, that connected them. And so there's a real opportunity here um, to actually go beyond the notions of property rights, which, by the way, our entire legal system is based on, um, to, to learn deeply from people, and it's why we say we, we really choose the language carefully of not who owned the land first, but who resided on the land or who occupied the land first. Um, and I, I wanted to tell a brief story and then, then, then kick it over to you all. Um, this past week, um, in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, the Apache Nation um, was making a plea for an injunction to stop. Uh, copper mining at a place called Oak Flat, which is in the Tonto National Forest, which is southeast of Phoenix. It's actually a place I've been and gone camping. Um, and uh, without going into detail about that case, sort of two things I want to point out about that. First is, members of the Apache Nation approached us at All Saints Church and said, would it be okay with you if we used All Saints as a base of operations? We're close to the Ninth Circuit offices um, for, you know, for this gathering that we're going to have. And, you know, we had a discussion, you know, about this. But, you know, even though none of this has gone to the vestry yet, we're already trying to learn from it. Um, and part of what we were thinking of is, well, if we're going to live into the theology of land uh, that we are getting from those who occupied this land before us, I don't want to say first occupied this land because, you know, who knows. Um, but our answer to that would have to be yes, uh, because this land is to be shared for the good of all, which, by the way, is also the theology of the church. Uh, if you go to Acts, and the earliest uh, recollection of a church that gathered in the name of Jesus, uh, what they said is, all shared all that they had and gave to each other as had need. That's actually the first economy that we know of of the church. The second piece was, as, as Chase and I and some others in our congregation sat in court listening to the argument, and thankfully the Apache Nation had some really good lawyers, what really struck me as the nation was actually not allowed to make its real argument. They had to make an argument based on the property rights legal system of the United States, that this should not be, you know, that, that, this, that, that treaties were violated, that they had ownership and they had access rights to this land. If you listen to the people in the Apache Nation, their real argument was, this land is sacred, and when you destroy land, you destroy spirit. Um, that's not an argument you can make in an American court. Uh, and so, you know, what, you know what, what's interesting is, as, as difficult as it can be to even sort of tell the whole story of a history, um, what we are just beginning to uncover, and we're uncovering it in relationship uh, is really a whole challenging of the American economic and legal system. 
Um, and it will be, you know, there'll be profound choices for us as we move forward in relationship, not just about our land, but how we are, um, and what can we learn uh, about how that we're called to live our lives. So, okay, sermon over with that. Uh, but I just want to say, are there any questions, thoughts, ideas, anything that comes up? Tom, here, let me come over to you. So I've been involved in environmental issues for a long time, and, and native issues come up frequently in relationship to public lands. So like Red Redbox, there's a Native American the, the facility or whatever that the forest, Angeles National Forest, uh, I guess, facilitates in some ways. And um, a lot of times there's displays of indigenous history and the relationship to the land and native plants and things in lots of parks and things. In fact, in so the land near Royal Seco, which is on your map or whatever, they're trying to remove non-native species and things, and that's happening all over the place or whatever. So everybody is learning a lot more about the wisdom of using native plants and how they were cultivated in the environment. Oak trees in particular are protected, and everybody's trying to promote oak trees and all the environmental benefits of oak trees and things. So it, yeah, in some ways, Native Americans on the West Coast are, 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 have a little easier time because there is so much public land, and it's easier to try to create some relationship uh, between the Native history and it abuses the land. If there is public land and these agencies are obliged to usually or they're inclined to try to work with them. So like cultural burning practices or whatever, the, if there's national forest, you know, there's been a lot of changes in the Forest Service willingness to look at working with Native tribes to allow Anyway, so I, I'm just saying that, that this is the easiest way, I think, for the Tongva, in which is, they, they, they had a peak name for them in, in the Verdugos or whatever. Tongva Peak is over in the Verdugo Hills area and everything. So anyway, so I, I would think that our group should look at the easiest way to, to create some reciprocity or is, is through the management practices on public lands, which have been expanding and they've been trying to more parks and more other things or whatever. But... It's hard, much harder, of course, to, to try to buy private land or whatever, but there is so much public land, so I would assume it's easier to focus on the management practices and the policies of public land agencies and city parks and you know, local or state and national and everything else. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess um, one of the significant things about um, the land return analysis, you know, as, as Mike was saying, like it's not necessarily um, just about you know, ownership of the land in the kind of the American sense, but it's about um, the stewardship of it, that it is um, looked after by um, its traditional caretakers, and also that it provides a space for the Tongva to gather, to conduct um, ceremonies, to um, house themselves, to basically, you know, use their land as they ought to be able to without having to ask permission of non-native landowners. Um, and so... Um, Moving towards, I, I, as you mentioned, with, with public land, if, um, if we're able to move towards um, incorporating indigenous stewardship um, into the management of those lands, I think that would definitely be a good thing. Yeah. We're, we're at time, and we've got to release Keith to get over to the church. Um, so we're going to say goodbye to everyone online. Good to see you all. Thank you. This is already posted on Facebook, and so it will also be on our YouTube page. We're going to get the... Uh, video from Edgar Perez up online. Uh, and also, you're going to be able to see these slides again online. And, and eventually, we're going to have the whole detailed report. And it is an amazing report. I really encourage, once it's posted, everyone to read it uh, online. And the vestry is going to be talking about where do we go next. And the one thing I promise you is, and I, I said this about both of these groups, you know, as soon as these reports are made, the vestry is going to move immediately into how do we structure ourselves for action. We did not do this work to have it sitting on a shelf. Um, and so just can we just thank these amazing people for all the work that they've done. Thank you all. Um, next Sunday's Palm Sunday, and we actually do have a forum on Palm Sunday. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney, who is our scholar and community here, uh, you'll see her in church this morning. She will be here to uh, talk about the women's lectionary, to talk about uh, the scholarship that she is doing, and we're going to be sort of uh, in conversation with her. And then she's also our preacher for Palm Sunday. So uh, 
come back then.